This is how you evolve as a poker player. And this is how you learn new concepts. This is a very important tip. Let's crush. Let me get this straight. It generally takes a lot of time and, and dedication in order to make some serious money with poker. However, there might be a few things that you might be missing that can easily be fixed and improve your win rate. Keep in mind, this won't turn you into a high stakes crusher. So I don't want you to now come ahead and be like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna be applying these three things and I'm gonna be a crusher. No, there's poker is very complex and I don't want you to have that misbelief. So please, please pay close attention. However, these, if you consider these three, it will definitely gain you an edge over your competitors and will help you improving your win rate. And that's the goal of this channel. So let's get right into it. First, considering this is probably a very trivial tip, but so heavily neglected. Considering ICM and future game in tournament poker. This means playing tight in the early stages. And yeah, just in general, when you are in the, at the beginning of your poker career, things might be very complicated with all these preflop ranges, preflop charts, and you're probably gonna end up in a lot of very marginal spots. And by the way, this is something I would also share with a high stakes crusher. A lot of you guys have a cash game background or you might have seen all these GTO charts, but keep in mind, they are only chippy V ranges. They do not consider future game, they don't consider ICM, which still exists in the early game. And it has a bigger impact than you think. If you just started out with poker, uh, this question might be coming uh, up right now, I can highly recommend signing up on raiseyouredge.com or with Paired for free, you get access to some preflop ranges, which we're gonna be sharing in the description. Um, and again, these are just chippy V preflop ranges to just give you an idea what kind of hands to play. But of course, we wanna take something here very important into consideration. Those are just pure chippy V ranges. And you should definitely play tighter than that, unless you have some strong reads, of course. There are spots where we can play looser when our opponents are too tight, but this is a different story. Um, so you should be playing tighter in a lot of these spots, especially when it comes to bigger pots, calling all-ins, going broke pre-flop, because we want to consider ICM, we want to consider um, future game. Future game means that in comparison to cash games and tournament poker, if you lose your stack, you out. Right? There's no future game, you're not going to be realizing any profitable future spots. In cash games, it is different because you can rebuy and you can essentially take every single plus EV spot. Also the ICM, the independent chip model, if you're new to poker and you hear that for the first time, just Google it. It means that every chip we win is less worth than every chip we lose. Po tournament poker, or especially when I the independent chip model is involved also in certain goals, poker becomes more of a surviving game because every single chip you lose is way more important or it's more important to keep that one chip than actually winning a chip. Doesn't mean that we're not looking forward to, to winning chips, but very often when it comes to situations where you might have a profitable call or an all-in or bluff according to chip EV just by accumulating chips, but just by considering chips, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a profitable play if we consider by ICM. And in fact, a marginal chip EV play might turn into a minus EV play if we consider that impact of ICM. However, I can make a separate video on that if you don't really know what ICM is. I don't know, let me know in the comments. Do you still feel very unsure what is ICM? What What is it, its impact? I'm happy to make a separate video on, around this topic just to provide you some insights on that. So then in connection or in combination with that video, then this might be even better for you. But let's focus on uh, the, the preflop part here where I want to tell you that, yeah, you should be playing tighter. You should consider that. And essentially every single spot where, yeah, you're supposed to call off, call, call an all in or call a reshuffle, or even then for post flop, you can take it further that whenever you're in a margin spot and you guys, even though you might not know everything, I don't know everything either in poker, but very often I know, okay, I know this is a margin spot. And whenever you have to tank a lot or you're not really sure, it already shows you're not printing the word, right? If you, if you have a good hand, you know, we have a clear value, but very often we have no brainers. But when you're not sure, always consider very likely it's going to be either slightly losing or slightly winning in, in a chip EV environment. Uh, so if you could then start considering, it's like, well, if you consider the ICM impact, then we should probably folding up, be folding our hand. If we uh, then also consider the future game, in tournament poker, which means that let's say you have 30 big blinds that you still have 
five, six, seven, eight more orbits. And it's more likely that you will get a higher EV spot than the one that you're putting yourself into. And if you keep realizing, if you keep taking those marginal spots where, you know, you're might be gaining 0.01 big blinds by pulling off a 40 big blind bluff or you're calling off a 30 big blind regem that is like slightly winning, but then you are missing out on these profitable spots in the future in the next few orbits. And yeah, you might be saying, well, then I might have a bigger stack. Well, this doesn't really count because again, you're also losing your stack. So we always need to look at both sides of the coin uh, just because you have the chance to double up, especially in the early game, mid game. It's far away from the bubble. There's nothing to exploit. There's nothing to abuse. The bigger step stack does not help you in the early game or mid game. So that that doesn't really count and doesn't make up for losing uh, a significant amount of EV. And of course, also, if you're the member of the Term Master class, in case you're watching right now or new, don't forget or don't worry. All the ranges are customized. So all the preflop ranges have this considered the ICM and future game impact. So they're way different than the chip EV, just pure GTO ranges. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that. And they're way more applicable to the real life and are way better. And just by knowing this, you can already make much better laydowns with marginal hands. And something that I would say uh, helps me also to survive the early game way more often than others is just by considering this. Right, this is not rocket science. This just requires some here, no, sorry, here, patience and also some discipline. And then you'll be able to, you know, uh, bring your stacks more often into the mid game. You know, tournament poker is about surviving the early stage. That's the very first step that we're aiming for, not building stacks in the early stages. It's not your main goal. The main goal is just to survive the early stages and then taking it further to the mid game and the late game. Of course, there are exceptions when you're less than 10 big blinds where we want to take more margin spots, we want to take more risk or even then start taking slightly minus EV spots because we're, you know, running out of options. But this is a different story, but there are always exceptions. So yeah, just by, by knowing this, you will be able to make much better laydowns uh, with much marginal hands that are being shown as, let's say, low frequency plays. You know, you, you see these charts and you see 10-9 suited or like 7-5 suited, it's like a 30% open or reshuffle. And then the other times before, it's essentially already telling you if it's only frequency play, then it's not like super printing and it's uh, in chip EV slightly winning, but then in tournament poker, it's very likely going to be slightly losing. And then of course we want to skip those hands. So just by knowing this will already help you. And remember, if you consider ICM a future game, this these plus EV chip EV spots will turn minus EV in tournament poker. The second tip I want to share with you is when it comes to improving your bluffing game, right? And I want to share two spots with you that help you illustrate what are good spots to bluff in and what are bad spots to bluff in. We're not going to be diving here into some uh, sophisticated pure sims or pure solvers. No, we're just going to be trying to approach it from a more logical standpoint, a little bit more generic. Uh, I also like these kind of videos a lot. I think they will help you also a lot. Um, in other videos, we can then dive again into some PO sims and, and be a little bit more precise with what kind of commas. This is more about the mindset here. This is about trying to open your eyes and, and hopefully give you a little push, maybe in a different direction to help you also yeah, uh, gain an edge in certain spots that you probably have not seen it as I'm trying to share that in that video. So as you know, people hate folding and I want to give you a rule of thumb when it comes to bluffing in, in big pots. Uh, spots that I try to avoid bluffing uh, in, in spots is where my opponents have a strong absolute hand range. That is very important. Absolute hand range. Um, let's or absolute range. So let's take the spot for where, for example, where I open from the hijack and the big blind defense and we're around 40 big blinds deep. And the board comes uh, king 7 3 rainbow. We see bet one third. He calls turn is a blank. Let's say a deuce. He checks, we bet pot, um, river is, let's say, a nine, just a very dry run out, run out a very typical static board, uh, nothing's too fancy, and then, you know, we have options to bluff. Don't really want to talk about specific hands, just in general, I, how, how I would approach the spots and how I differentiate between different board textures, according to my experience. Of course, I, diff I um, deviate also here from GTO because I try to consider what people do in real life and what are the mistakes that we want to take advantage on. So would I be bluffing here a lot? No, of course I wouldn't. Why? Because he's supposed to start folding some king eggs on the river. Um, especially when we use a larger sizing, maybe 80%, 90%, 100% pot size or slightly over or over pot size, which people rarely do. 
And once they call the turn, it's very likely the, that he has a king. First of all, he's not going to have a lot of deuce x x, deuce x hands. He's not going to have a lot of three x hands that he's calling a preflop. He's going to call, going to call these on the flop, of course, if, if he has something like 10-3 suited, but he's most likely going to be falling these on the turn. So he's mostly having a few 7x hands. They're not really like ace high draws possible. Um, he's not going to be calling, like, of course, he's calling some 7x hands, but his range is very king x heavy. Um, so now a lot of his king x become like bottom of the range. And in fact, some 7x, x, 7x hands might be better bluff catchers than some of the king x hands. So people then still like, will call some 7x, but they will call a majority of their king x. So the way people approach this spot is they think, oh, well, I have top hair, I have a strong hand. Well, in terms of the absolute hand strength, yes, top hair is good, right? In terms of the hand ranking, that's how people think, well, I have a top hair here. I didn't raise on the previous, like I raised my two pair sets on earlier street. So like I have to call it down, right? This is how a lot of people think. And then their curiosity, especially lower stakes, mid stakes. And also this is more applicable for the early stages of the tournament. People have a hard time falling those. So, especially when they can re-enter. So these are the spots you should really try to stay away from. Um, and if they would think in relative hand strength, then they would realize that given the line that the king x, the top hair is not so strong anymore. And this is just where um, you have to be very careful. Even if you calling to GTO and you look at the solver and you would find that your ace four or your queen jack is like, a, it shows you it's supposed to be bluff. Again, it only considers chip EV. If you consider the fact that uh, the, the ICM impact, same as in the first tip, then these marginal plus EV bluffs will actually be minus EV. And we want to heavily under bluff these spots according to, or well, yeah, according to the way population plays. So those are the spots where, especially very static boards, where very often the top pair on the flop remains the top pair on the river, dry ace high, king high, queen high boards, where it's very likely once he calls the turn against the large sizing again, he's going to be having one of these top pairs very frequently. Um, I would stay away from bluffing these spots, especially on low stakes and probably even on mid stakes. I always say, and you might have heard it from me a lot on the course, don't try to bluff people off top hairs. It has helped me a lot and probably saved me a lot of money on lower mid-stakes. I mean, I, I still run my stupid bluffs and I hate myself for, uh, afterwards, but this is what I can share you here uh, from my experience. Uh, let's take the same spot and change the board texture, which I think is then a good spot to bluff, which would be, let's say, king 7-6 suited. Um, there's a flush draw. Uh, turn is a nine and river jack. So let's say you have king and clubs, seven and clubs and, and six and spades, whatever. And, and jack and nine, whatever kind of suits. You see here that once we bury the turn, he will have way more weaker hands coming to the river with, right? He's going to have like pair and an open eight straight draw, pair and a flush draw. He can have hands like nine, eight, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. And also given that the board is relatively wet, he's going to be fast playing his two pairs, sets or whatever, more often on the turn, right? On the previous board, he's incentivized or he probably is gonna feel that more often he will be slow playing a hand because the board is dry, doesn't need a lot of protection, especially if you have maybe a little more aggressive image. So there on the second board, he will also not have as, as uh, two pairs sets as often as in the previous board. So on the river, he comes yeah, he's going to have way more pair and a draw, second, third pair, fourth pair and a draw, maybe an ace or a queen and flush draw. So there, bluffing your queen high, your 10 high is way more appealing. He's going to be having way more call, call, so call, flop, call, turn, forward, hands on the river than in the previous spot. So it's way more attractive to bluff, bluff here since he's going to have more snap forwards than in the previous board. And also, we can manipulate uh, his, his folding range a little bit more by choosing uh, a smaller sizing. So very often the people, you know, fold exactly the same amount of hands against the 60% sizing than uh, same as against like a 75 or 80% sizing where, um, yeah, we can of course take advantage of that and give ourselves a much better price and maybe bluff half pot or 66% pot. We only try to target those second, third, fourth pairs, ace high, queen high flush draws with our jack highs, 10 highs that we're trying to bluff or even just an ace high. We can still be very aggressive. I mean, since we bet the flop, we bet the turn, we still have all the two pairs, top pairs, sets. You should also be value betting something like king, queen. I mean, this is a spot where, of course, you should never fold a top here, but uh, since we're also going to be having a lot of draws ourselves. But there, people don't understand that actually here, since we can have so many bluffs, it's so much better to maybe sometimes hero call something like 7-8 or, you know, the 10-9 the type of hands. 
but this is where people just don't have this understanding of, of how the ranges interact with the boards, the board run out, and also how a prefab range interacts with the board, especially when you play against beginners, if you play against recreationals. But I see also like, like regulars massively overcalling these static boards, and then they never find these bluff catchers, these hero calls in the second spot. But just think about when you have a flush draw there, you have all the fourth pairs in the flush draw, A-side flush draws, and you sometimes, you have to call down there over second and third pair, way more often than in the previous spot. Keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, this exploit is very important when it comes to yeah crushing low and mid stakes, of course. Uh, it doesn't take hours of studying. Uh, it just takes some like shutting the fuck up and listening and applying it. And then marking these spots, revisiting them, looking them over if you have applied it correctly. And then of course, you know, um, opening a PyroSim or whatever kind of tool you're using, looking it up if, if what you did makes sense or posting a hand in a forum or discord asking for feedback this is how you evolve as a poker player and this is how you learn new concepts and this is a very important tip and it's also very important to do some note looking for example in the first spot if you think people aren't folding the top pairs as much as the solver wants them to fold then let them call more top pairs and see how little you start bluffing and on the second spot if you think people fold more often on the river then you know amend, adjust those ranges, note lock it, and then see how much we're suddenly supposed to be bluffing. And then of course it becomes way more profitable, right? And this is then where we are also good with these huge bluffs in these spots because it generates a decent profit, even if we consider ICM in future game. And then you will also realize that in the first spot, it's probably really stupid to find those bluffs because people are not capable of folding top hairs. All right, the last tip for today is being way more aggressive against big stacks around the bubble. Uh, I sometimes, or not sometimes, very often I see mid stakes just being way too tight, freezing up. I just want to make it on the money. Well, there's still a certain place we can make in order to accumulate some chips, uh, set, up, set us up in a better position. Again, here also making plays that generate a decent profit with a smart risk, with a smart investment, uh, generating rewards that are the worst risking and not making some big puns where in, in the best case it's going to be slightly profitable. But we need to pay a little more attention to the stack sizes here. I would not recommend doing it when you are in a situation that you're going to be comfortably making to the money. But let's say you three bet or you make a move and you lose the three bet or you lose the pot and it puts you in a position where you then suddenly have to worry about making it uh, into the money at all. Let's take, for example, the situation, you know, you have a bunch of 7 to 12 big blind stacks, you're getting closer to the bubble or you're on the stone bubble and you have, let's say, 24, 20, 25 big blinds, whatever. And one of the big stakes open from later positions, you know, they're going to be having like 9-8 off, jack-7 off, king-5 off, bunch of these hands are going to be opening 40, 50, 60, 70% hands or even more. And, you know, you have 25 big blinds. And even against the five big blind sizing, we give, give ourselves an incredible prize. I mean, I would probably still use with aces, kings, queens. So we should definitely also, we can definitely mix in some bluffs, um, attack these hands. I mean, what is he supposed to do with king eight off? What is he supposed to do with jack seven off? Especially if you don't have the crazy maniac image, it's really good to be very aggressive there with offsuited aces. You can even mix in some offsuited kings, offsuited uh, king x hands. Just watch these YouTube replays. A lot of these big stacks are just way out of line, which is good because people are not playing back and they can just run over the table with a lot of open raises, but it's so easy to punish. And even if you lose the pot, you're down to 20 big blinds, 19, 18 big blinds. There's still a bunch of shorter stacks. It's totally fine. Like you haven't, it doesn't change your situation, but you can accumulate a lot of chips in this in the long run taking down like these three four big blind pots and you survive the bubble with 30 32 big blinds instead of 17 16 big blinds so these are the spots that you should look out for and even if you have let's say 15 16 big blinds and you have a bunch of three or four big blind stacks you can still three but four to five big blinds five and a half big blinds against the big stacks you're still going to be making to the money. Of course, again, if you it puts you in a situation where you suddenly become the shortest stack or your gap to the shortest stack is only one big blind and you really have to worry about making to the money, then you should really consider it and not do it. Or at least only when you have a very strong read. So uh, the likelihood of succeeding in this spot is very, very high that you know that someone is very out of line and He's not going to be like four betting you very light or just jamming. Uh, of course, I know also a lot of high stakes rec who do exactly that. If I have my king x hand, if I have my ace x hand, I go all in. Yada, nothing. Like I just go for it and there's nothing they can do about it. So keep that in mind. And uh, 
course, this purpose of this video is uh, to help you take your game further. If you um, want to study these bots, um, do it. Um, but I think just, just understanding that there's some things where we can deviate from theory and we also need to consider some concepts that even GTO poker or, or the, the chip EV ranges that, that we see that are based on GTO do not consider very important concepts and will then, of course, um, yeah, improve our game by considering it. And if you don't do it, then you will constantly yeah, punt your stacks away or put yourself in margin spots that are not necessary. But once again, let me know what you want to see in the future. Um, happy to to do more content around these concepts and then see you guys at the table it's good luck